Good morning and welcome to webinar number 13 of our series. Today we're going to be talking all about simulation in power electronics and this can be quite a contentious subject depending on who you talk to but I'm really looking forward to it. Um, my name is Ian Mosley. Um, joining me today on the call we have Jose. Uh, Jose will be uh, doing some presentations next, next week talking about condition monitoring in uh, power electronic devices but today you've got me. I'm talking all about simulation. Um, Today's webinar will last about one hour. If you've joined us before, the idea is that uh, we have about a one hour webinar and then a 15 minutes or so question session at the end. If you look on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a few boxes where you can interact with our webinars. So firstly, there's a chat box. Um, uh, Jose is manning the chat box today. Uh, that will allow you to raise any questions and problems you might be having on the webinar, more of the sort of the, the, the technical interaction with the webinar or any issues there. Or you can just use it to say hi to people if you want to as well. Um, there's also a questions box. Uh, so if you do hopefully come up with some questions during the material I present today, please put them in the questions box and we will take time at the end of the webinar to go through those questions and hopefully discuss them um, together with Jose here. Uh, we'll also be launching some polls as we progress through the content today, just to give us a feeling of um, uh, whether you're engaging with the content that we've got here, whether it's something that's relevant and interesting for you. Um, so with that said, um, oh, sorry, I, I should also say all of our webinars we do record. Uh, so all of them are available on demand, which you should have a link for now. Either that or you can go to our website and you can access all of our webinars on demand uh, from this whole series through our website. Um, we've, we're, we're more than halfway through now. and We've had a very good session so or set of sessions so far talking about all sorts of areas of power electronics. So today is simulation. And without further hesitation, I will bring up my slides and we'll get started. Okay, so firstly, what I, I, when I was putting this webinar together, I, th I thought, well, what, what would ideally I like you to take away from the, what I'm talking about today? Um, I'd like to be able to give you my perspective on what I think the benefits and risks of power electronic simulation are. There's no perfect tool to my knowledge anywhere. So real, really what I want to try and communicate is where, where simulation can add value to what you're doing and where you have to be a little bit careful. Um, really, I also want to give you an idea on how we use simulation to de-risk power electronic development. That's its main benefit to us. Uh, so I'll give you a few examples of how we've actually used different simulation tools to help us develop power converters. Um, there are a number of different packages available um, for simulating power electronics. Some of them are free open source tools and some are commercial tools. We don't have an affiliation to any particular vendor. Um, we use certain particular tools just through historic reasons. But I'll give you a list of different tools at the end that you, you can pick from for either free or, or commercially available tools. Um, the examples I'm going to talk about today are based on uh, our 50 watt flyback converter this this is a converter that i keep referring back to throughout this powerful knowledge series so in some of the earlier webinars we spent some time looking at how to design the magnetics for that 50 watt mains flyback including finite element analysis and in today's webinar we're going to look at simulating that very same converter but also looking at um, maybe modeling the closed loop uh, uh, frequency response of that converter you can use a simulation tools to look at frequency response for example so i'm trying to create the common theme around that that individual converter and how you can look at it from multiple different aspects depending on what you're trying to optimize in your design so the agenda, I'll start off with the benefits and risks, because I think that gives us a really good context of, um, of, of how we can use these tools moving forwards. Um, my perception then of where does it actually make sense to use simulation, um, and, and that depends on multiple different parameters. Um, the two tools that I'm going to talk about, the first of which is, um, is SPICE, or actually we use PSPICE, which is a cadence tool set. Um, and I'm going to give some examples of how we use that what its strengths are and what its weaknesses are. We also use a simulation package called Plex, um, which is a dedicated power electronic simulation package, which is very powerful. Um, I'll give you some examples of that, um, some of its strengths, and because it's, no tool is perfect, we'll also sh show you some of its weaknesses as well. Um, so each tool has a slightly different uh, set of features that can be used to optimize your converter, depending on what you're trying to do. 
Uh, then I'll list out those other tools, both free and commercial, you might want to take a look at. And then we'll have a summary and questions at the end. So, simulation, benefits and risks. Um, question one, maybe you could launch question one for us, Jose. Um, this is just to give me an idea on whether you use simulation in your, in your everyday lives at the moment or not. So, benefits of simulation. I think in my perspective, that fall, they fall into two main areas. It's an education tool you can use to improve your understanding of power circuits or all sorts of circuits. And it should be considered then a productivity tool to enhance your development of your, you know, speed up the development of your power electronics converter. So as an education tool, it's a very, very useful platform. Whatever platform you're, you're using, it can be a very useful platform to quickly learn about aspects of new topologies. Maybe there's a particular power converter topology you've never played with before. So if you're familiar with a simulation environment, you can do your early learning on that simulation environment, which tends to be a little bit faster than actually just building something. If you don't know how, how something works, if you just build it, there's every chance it might just blow up. So simulation is great for, for de-risking that. Um, I think simulation has its best place looking at very detailed subsections of a converter. So we don't typically model a whole converter in its full complexity of all different aspects at the same time. For example, it might be we're looking at trying to stabilize a particular converter. So we might want to model the frequency response of some opto isolated feedback scheme for a flyback converter, for example. So we might just model that one part of it and ignore the rest of it. You're just, you're just focusing on one particular area or if you're having trouble meeting um, perhaps 61,000-4-5 uh, differential mode surge, like a lightning strike surge, you can use, in fact, we have used simulation models to predict surge energy levels on the front end of converters, um, including nonlinear effects. And therefore, in that case, you're just modeling that one part of it. And that gives you a real deep insight into what's going on. But you don't really care about the rest of the converter at that point. You're just focusing on one area. So. I think as an education tool, looking at little subsections of a converter can be very empowering. In terms of a development tool, um, simulation, if used correctly, um, gives you a better chance of your hardware, hardware working properly first time. Um, and that's, that's probably one of its main benefits. If used correctly, you, you, you're going to save development costs and development time. Ultimately, it reduces the cost of developing power electronic systems if it's used properly. Um, it also, um, if you have a good simulation model in place, you can actually use that simulation model to examine behaviors of, of some parts of your converter that you can't actually measure on the bench. For example, you're looking at the transient temperature of a semiconductor junction in a power device. You can't obviously measure that on the bench, but you can get a good idea using a Kawa model, um, which are available from manufacturers now, of the transient thermal effects. So during pulse loading, overloading, you can actually have a look at what's going on at the junction temperature. Or perhaps under um, some transient load conditions, you're interested in the flux density in your transformer core, or your, your magnetic core. Unless you've got some sort of probe to measure that, which is unlikely, it's difficult to know exactly what the flux density is doing in your transformer core. So you can actually just do that. Your simulation can give you that sort of detail quite quickly. And as, as I say, generally, it reduces development time and costs if it's used correctly. And that's where its real value add is. However, there's, you know, there's no free lunch here. So there are some risks of simulation as well. And I've broken it down into those two same areas here. So risks of simulation firstly if you have a poor model or poor, poor model accuracy then your simulation will give you poor data so if you don't control or if you just bring in models from a third party without quite knowing whether they're good or not you might start uh, concluding misleading um, uh, uh, conclusions from from those simulation results and if, that, if you carry on simulating too long with the wrong model, all, all effectively you're doing is costing yourself time. So poor model accuracy is one of the, one of the big problems here. And that depends, you know, model accuracy is a subjective thing. A good model is, is a bad model to someone else. It depends what you're modeling. So keep an eye on your model accuracy and make sure you know how those models work. Um, different simulation platforms, as you'll see later on, 
simulate um, the circuit using different algorithms. And depending on what you're simulating and trying to conclude, that might impact the results. Things like time step sizes as well, or how uh, the simulation engine treats uh, switching transitions, all of those things vary from one package to another. So you've got to be a little bit careful and knowledgeable about how your simulation environment actually works. Um, this is a big one for power electronics. Um, if you don't know what your circuit parasitics are, then you're not going to put them into your circuit simulation and therefore you're going to get waveforms out which are wrong. So um, we all know in the real world in power electronics you have PCB trace inductance, you have capacitance between components, between traces and, and power planes and all sorts of bits and pieces. So it's a, the real world is a very complex place. Um, if you're interested in ringing and all that sort of stuff, if you don't model those trace inductances and capacitances or, or other, or other non or, or parametric effect uh, par parameters in a component which aren't given by your model or by your manufacturer, then how can you expect the answers to be correct? So if you don't, that, that's really just a, um, an opportunity for error to creep in, creep in because you just aren't modeling the correct thing. Um, this is a big one. Um, if you're, if you're as a user, maybe you're just starting out on your power electronics journey, if you like, um, it's very difficult for you early in your power electronics career to question the results of a simulation because you have no practical basis to know whether something is necessarily right or wrong. Um, and this actually reminds me of um, uh, very early days of, uh, of my experience working in power electronics. Um, I was just starting my, my PhD working on power electronic systems and I, I, I was very pleased. I, I, I'd come up with a simulation of a converter I was working on and I very proudly took this to my supervisor um, who, who took a look at my simulation and just said, no, I don't believe that. Um, I, I, you need to go and build something. And I, was, I remember feeling very frustrated because I'd spent a lot of time on this simulation. But I think he was right, actually. And the, the reason he was right is not because my simulation was necessarily wrong. It's because at that point in my career, I didn't have any sort of or a huge amount of practical experience building electronics. So he was trying to encourage me to get the bench experience to build up my practical power electronics experience to be able then to utilize the simulation and be able to query its results. So if you're very early in your career in power electronics, be careful of over simulating too much. Sometimes it's better to build stuff on the bench and just build up that, that expertise. Um, as a development tool, I've seen this happen actually on multiple occasions with engineers. Um, uh, I didn't know really what I want to call it without it sounding negative, um, but essentially uh, there's a risk during development of over simulation or really procrastination. It's, it's very easy to put a simulation together generally. And if a simulation goes wrong, it's very easy just to recorrect re it. So if you over simulate because you're just enjoying doing the simulation, it might actually delay hardware development for no additional project, project risk reduction. And that's that's a problem because ultimately really what a power, what power electronic simulation should be for is to, is to de-risk a project and make sure you deliver your hardware uh, in a shorter time frame. So be careful of over-simulating. You know, you need, simulation should be used just enough to de-risk your project and then go on and build your hardware. Um, actually, before I come to that point there, the amount of simulation to do really is something that you you need to look at the um, the, the, the the consequences of your power converter going wrong. If you're building a one megawatt power converter, you'd probably put a lot of effort into simulation on the front end to give you as much chance of that converter running uh, working well first time as possible because the consequence of it going wrong are pretty catastrophic. However, if it's just a, a little 50 watt flyback like I keep talking about here, we've developed enough of those over the years that there's pretty much no point in simulating. We just know how to build them. Um, so it really depends what you're doing and that therefore the amount of simulation you do really should be judged against the, 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 the risk and consequences of your first hardware prototype going wrong. Um, and this, yeah, the limited value add, again, this is the case of the 50 watt converter I was just talking about. If you're a very experienced designer, you wouldn't bother simulating that because you've done it so many times before. Um, 
and the cost of time spent simulating it must be balanced against the risk of that hardware not working um, so don't get trapped in the over simulation um, trap there you can burn a lot of time with with simulating too much for no real benefit so where do we think it makes sense to use simulation um, so as I said before, we tend to use it here for modeling specific parts of a converter's operation. And then when, when you do that simulation, you try and simplify the rest of the converter as far as practically possible. Oops, gone too far there. So firstly, um, you'll see an example later in this presentation where we have actually used um, simulation to predict the small signal um, frequency response of a power stage to be able to close the loop. Now, un under those simulation conditions, there's no point in using a full MOSFET model for the transistors in, because it doesn't really affect the power stage small or the main major dynamics of the power stage small signal response significantly. Um, and also, you know, do you really want to model your the nonlinearity of your um, your magnetics, your ferrite core? Well, that shouldn't have a significant bearing on the, the low order behavior of your control loop. So no, I would, I would just model that as a linear um, as a linear material and therefore speed my simulation up. So here, we're, in that case, we're just interested in the small signal response. So we model the major dynamics and try and simplify everything else as much as possible. Another example I spoke about a moment ago, and we have done this for customers actually, 61,000-4-5 um, is that, that's your typical 4kV lightning surge type um, common mode and differential mode surge that you would might you might test to for your power supply. Um, well, in that case, really, if you're going to do simulation for that, there's no point in having a closed loop power converter there. What we did is just model the um, the front end EMI filter, including nonlinear effects like saturation of, of magnetics, for example. Um, and uh, and the surge devices, the MOVs, and you can get all those models. And then the rest of the converter, we just put that there as, a, as essentially a resistor load, loading up that network. So we're just interested in modeling that specific part. Closed loop operations, so you can extend that small signal response data you get, and then close the loop, and you can simulate closed loop operation and check that the thing looks stable uh, before you actually built it. Um, EMI filter frequency response, if you're struggling with EMI compliance, you can go about modeling the, the common mode and differential mode characteristics of your EMI filter. You probably need to measure some of their parasitic effects like self-resonant frequencies in chokes and, and other inductors just because they are dominant mechanisms in the frequency band you're interested in. Um, but in that case, you, you, you would just model that as a, as, a, as, as a filter with a fixed resistor load on the output and the, the listen input would be 50 ohms, for example. So you can, again, just focus on one part of your circuit. And device switching behavior, uh, we did some work recently looking at diode behavior on the output of um, high power converters. Uh, and we were very interested in the behavior of QRR and the impact that had on power loss in that particular converter. So we actually made um, some device models where we, we were able to play around with the QRR behavior uh, and ignore the rest of the effects in that device. So we could examine just the particular aspects of that converter we were interested in. But we don't need necessarily a full converter for doing that. We can, we can simplify everything else. So... Hopefully, um, that gives us a nice context now for um, why we might want to do simulation. And now I'm going to start talking a little bit about uh, the two tools that we do use, the first one of which is PSPICE. So a little bit of background first on, on SPICE. Hopefully, most of you may have come across this, um, this tool in the past. So SPICE itself was, a, is a, is, was an open source circuit simulation environment or package or engine developed in the early 70s at, in, in the, at the US, the University of Berkeley in California. Um, uh, and it's found its way into multiple different areas of, of, of electrical electronic simulation ever since. Um, it, originally, it was focused on simulating integrated circuits, and the acronym is Simulation Program with Integrated Circuit Emphasis. So it gives you a little bit of a clue on what it was originally focused for. Um, 
The Spice engine itself is open source, so it's used in both free tools and in commercial tools. And the, the one I'm going to talk about here is a commercial tool from Cadence called PSpice. Um, and what you tend to find is that the commercial tools start bolting on additional either post-processing capability or macro model development or other, other ways to allow you to enhance that underpinning Spice engine to make it into something you can use in multiple different ways. And I'll show you some examples of how we've used it in a moment. Um, one thing that's important to remember, Spice uh, will attempt to model the switching transitions. And so in a power electronic circuit, Spice will attempt to model that transition, uh, the switching transition of the device, the power, the power MOSFET BJT correctly, um, as well as the conduction periods in between. And if you imagine what happens when you've got a very fast um, switching transition in a circuit it means the spice engine has to put a lot of data points and a lot of calculations as it goes through that switching trajectory to get it accurate um, and therefore spice it can be quite slow so if you're interested in modeling those switching transitions like that example before i gave you about modeling qrr effects in diodes then it's the perfect tool because it allows you to really play around and look at those very very specific events however it can be slow and if you're doing for example um a control loop analysis maybe it doesn't really make any sense to use a simulation tool that is modeling switching transitions for example um Again, I mentioned this before, you need to make sure you understand the device models provided by manufacturers. Don't just take them um, without at least taking a look at how they've been put together. Um, I'll, I'm going to talk in a minute about device macro models. These are really, really useful um, uh, templates that allow you to build your own devices of the complexity level, which makes sense for whatever you're uh, doing in particular. Um, you can in also include behavioral blocks, mathematical blocks, but personally speaking, I've not found those to be particularly friendly, but it can be done. And the good thing about, so one good thing about Spice is there's a great post-processing capability. So when you get the, um, the results of your simulation out, you can perform all sorts of mathematical um, functions on all of the different parameters and look at some really interesting effects. And that's very powerful when you want to look at all sorts of different things here. So I'll, I'll show you that in just a moment. So let's, <laughs> let's focus back on my 50 watt flyback, my favorite converter. Um, and this is an example of a piece spice simulation where we've modeled that flyback converter here pretty much as an ideal circuit or as ideal as we can make it. Um, so what I've done is I've made an ideal switch here. So rather than actually using a full MOSFET model, we've just put a switch, a, a block in here in the on state when it's turned on, it just has an on resistance. I can't remem remember what we actually used here. Maybe it's half an ohm or something like that. And in the off state, it has a resistance of maybe one or two mega ohms. Um, and it's controlled by this ideal source here. Um, so that is about as simple as you can get for that primary side switch. Um, I have modeled these magnetic components, and I'll talk about that in just a couple of slides time uh, using nonlinear modeling um, because it's quite an interesting thing to do. You can see this D brake diode. That is a, the breakout parts are really useful. Um, that is about the most basic diode you can put in a circuit here. Uh, and it gives you the ability just to have a very simple diode model rather than a very, very complex one. And it depends what you're simulating. If you don't need to have an accurate diode model, just use a very basic diode model. And then we've got an ideal capacitor and resistor. So from this simulation, the waveforms that we get predicted by P-SPICE is pretty much as we expect for this 50 watt flyback running at 100 kilohertz. Uh, it's running from a 325 volt DC input, which is um, the output of the bridge rectifier with about a 230 volts RMS input. So about 325 volts DC coming in here. And it's a, I've assumed from them there's no 100 hertz ripple on there. And we're running about 50 watts output power. And you can see here, we can probe, we can look at the core flux density. So the core flux density is, it's, it's actually just running in continuous conduction mode. So you, the core flux density never quite gets to zero. It peaks at about 290 millitesla, which is fine. This is an N87 material. So 290 millitesla's is well within its operating range. The output voltage, um, you can see this is the output ripple um, on the resistor R1 here. 
Uh, there's a bit of ripple there. And you can see there's an underlying profile. The voltage in is increasing slightly here. And that's because this is actually only 10 milliseconds into the simulation. And therefore, the initial startup behavior is still calming down a little bit there. But generally, we're in the right operating window. Um, the green trace here is the primary current. So it's nice linear climbing current climbs up to one amp. So it's this, this graph here. So we climb up to just over one amp. And then the secondary side current, so the current flowing through this diode is the red, and that's this axis here. So it's about three amps, and it comes back down. So you can see this is operating just in CCM operation. Um, and that's also evident from the drain source voltage of the primary side switch here. We're going uh, roughly from naught to about, uh, I think it's around about, well, just under 500 volts, something like that. I think the VOR of this design is 135 volts. So 135 plus 325 gives you the peak we're, we're sitting at here. So that all looks pretty nice. Yeah, we're just into CCM operation. Let's do the same simulation now, but let's put a, MOS, a real MOSFET model in, in the place of that ideal switch. Oh, before we do though, there's question two, please, Jose. Okay. So the 50 watt flyback waveforms, let's put a real MOSFET in here. Um, so exactly the same circuit here. I've, I've used um, uh, an Infineon cool MOS, 800 volt cool MOS device, which has a quoted data sheet value of 0.45 ohms on resistance here. Um, uh, we, we're driving it now from 0 to 12 volts because that's the sort of gate drives we want to use for this. And I've put a three ohm arbitrary gate drive resistor in there just to give it a bit of gate drive impedance. But the rest of the circuit is the same. So if we look here, I've just captured now the drain source voltage and the peak and the primary current. So the drain source voltage is just under 500 volts again. And the peak primary current is, um, yeah, just over one amp, one and a bit amps here. Um, pretty much the same as what we had before. You can see, though, we're starting to get some artifacts here on the switching waveform. Um, and that's because this device actually has output capacitance now as well. And I think it also includes um, bond wire inductance inside. So it actually models the bond wire inductance in this model. So therefore, we're starting to get some switching transient events that you actually start to see in practice. So actually, arguably, using the, the real MOSFET model here, we're getting switching waveforms which are closer to what you would see on the bench. Um, the downside of this, though, is if you don't really care about those uh, ringing waveforms, the cost you've paid for this is the simulation time using that behavioral approach on the previous slide. It took about four and a half seconds to simulate that in PSPICE for 10 milliseconds of operation. It's gone up by a factor of 24. It took nearly two minutes to run this simulation for that same 10 milliseconds just by replacing that um, ideal switch with a real MOSFET model. So. The cost you're paying here is simulation time. So unless you're really interested in modeling the, the switching transitions exactly correctly, avoid using real MOSFET models here, uh, unless you, there's something particular about that model you, that forces you to do that. Um, you should try and make your simulation as simple as possible based on what you're trying to, to, to use it for. I thought I would put up, just for reference, I, I only put this... Um, additional uh, piece in the simulation just before uh, presenting today, because I thought it would be useful just to show you what a typical mo uh, P-SPICE model looks like for that. And this is the P-SPICE model for that MOSFET, the, the, on, the, the Infineon part here. So you can see here that there's quite a lot going on. So rather than it just being a simple on resistance, we've now got firstly three inductances so we've got an inductance of the bond wire for the gate the drain and the source and you know seven nanohenries three nanohenries and seven nanohenries um so we've got we're starting to model the the, the parasitics there they've also included some um some uh, uh, source resistance here and gate resistance here the gate resistance is one ohm the source resistance is one milliohm these blocks here the m1 block here that's actually a a, um, a MOSFET macro model, which I'll, I'll describe what the macro models are on in a few slides time. Um, but you can see here there's multiple MOSFETs actually being used as part of this model. There's also drain source capacitance. There's a body diode in there. All of the sort of bits and pieces that you'd have to put in there to make it a device model which behaves 
more closely to reality. And that's the purpose of this model, is to give you something which is much closer to reality. But it's only worth doing that if that's really important to you in terms of how you, you're using your simulation. So hopefully that gives you a perspective on the complexity that models. And this is actually quite a simple model. Um, I've seen far more complex models from different vendors, including all sorts of strange effects that maybe don't add a great deal to your simulation, but cost you a lot of simulation time. So one of the most useful things we've found for um, the PSPICE um, environment is the model editor where you can create your own parts um, and you can build them based on data sheet parameters. So the example I'm going to give you here is, is how we might want to go about building a diode. So when you open up the model editor and you start to build, I've just called it the EML diode. So it's an arbitrary diode and you can start um, building up your diode macro model by literally typing in data, for example, at, for a given temperature, VF versus IF data, which you can get from a manufacturer's data sheet. Um, you can put nonlinear uh, output junction, uh, sorry, output drain source capacitance. So drain source capacitance is a function of drain source voltage. Again, that can be done at different temperatures as well. Reverse leakage current. Um, so again, leakage current versus uh, output voltage at different temperatures. Um, you can see here, each time I click on one of these um, different windows, a little tick box, these little tick boxes light up. So you can see there's actually these parameters, which I'll show you in a minute, are parameters which are then used in the macro model. So for example, on this reverse leakage macro model, these two parameters here, the ISR and the NR parameters, then become active. Um, so if, if you were to then change your, your values in your curves here, the model ed editor will look at that and extract values then to map into these particular parameters, which are then used in the macro model. Um, so moving on, we can look at reverse breakdown, specified here. And I think the last one, this is, a, this is one that's been really useful for us, reverse recovery behavior. You can specify the reverse recovery time based on <coughs> um, a certain forward current here, so a forward conducting current. You can specify the maximum reverse recovery current here. Um, the reverse recovery time, so how long it takes to recover. And this factor here, the RT factor, gives you an ability to control the softness of the recovery. So by changing RT, you can make it a very fast recovery diode, which might be a bit snappy, or you can make it very soft recovery, which will give you a softer recovery, but burn a bit more power. Um, the model editor itself is very useful. Um, we've mainly used it for diodes and MOSFETs so far, but you can model diodes, BJTs, magnetic cores, IGBTs, JFET, op-amp, MOSFET comparator, linear regulator, and voltage reference. So this allows you to create your own parts based on data sheet parameters, and therefore you can go in and create and just simulate the parameters and the behavior you're most interested in for your design. Uh, could we launch question three there, please? So let's let's look at this diode example. So the simple diode model, when you dig through the literature, this is what the diode macro model is going to model. Um, you have a resistance, just a, a resistance in your in your circuit here. Um, you have a current and you have a nonlinear capacitance. And actually, if you dig out all of the different parameters that can be modeled by the diode macro model. There's a, there's a huge number here, and you don't have to use all of them. Um, you just, just use ones you're interested in, in modeling. So for example, if, you're not, if you don't care about reverse you know, breakdown voltage, just don't put it in there. The model will still work. Um, it, it's, it's a very powerful way you can then um, use this tool. So the interesting thing, I think, about the sort of the, the SPICE approach and the macro model approach is that the parameters that are specified either by um, you typing them in directly or using the model ed editor to extract them from curves, um, they're directly then used uh, within the SPICE engine on the semiconductor equations. So for example, the diode equations for the DC current, this ID current, which is the current through the, through the junction here, um, is a function of all of these different parameters. Or for example, the capacitance, the nonlinear capacitance here is a function of all these different parameters as well. So it's modeling physical effects in your system really is, is the, probably the best way to put it. Um, 
the most simple, you know, that diode brake model, the D brake I used in the in the flyback converter example. The most simple model is simply this, um, and it's a, it's a it's a diode where the IS parameter is uh, one times ten to the minus fourteen. CGO is 0.1 picofarads, and the source resistance, or sorry, the series resistance is 0.1 ohms, and that will give you a very basic diode to allow you to do very fast, simple simulations if you don't care about diode behavior too much. Um, the next thing I wanted to demonstrate is modeling magnetics in P-SPICE. Uh, if you joined us a few weeks ago, we, we talked about magnetics design um, and loss and all that sort of stuff and finite element analysis. Well, in P-SPICE, you can actually put in your magnetic circuit parameters, including history, hysteretic effects as well. Um, so they can then be used to create nonlinear coupling between windings on real magnetic components. So it's getting you closer to the real behavior of a real magnetic component. Um, so this is an example I've, I, I put together for this presentation whereby we've used model edit, editor now to import the BH curve data for N87 material from TDK and put it into this environment here. So you can see here that we're we're actually able to pull in the, uh, a model of full hysteresis curve, which is something that we've not been able to do in, uh, in in the analysis. The rest of the analysis I showed so far, we've actually got a full hysteresis curve in the simulation environment itself. Um, this particular approach uses something called the Giles Atherton model. Uh, which is a way to model um, nonlinear BH curves in magnetic materials. Um, and I won't go into the maths of that there because it's, it's, it's quite frankly very, very complex. But there are certain key parameters that, again, when you put the BH curve information in, like tabulated data here, this system will then extract these parameters to allow you then to model it using the Giles Atherton model. Um, do watch out, though, if you do this. Uh, with units, we got caught out with this a little bit. Um, there's a mixture of Gauss, Ersted, and centimeters all mixed together, so you need to make sure you're using the correct units there. Um, yep, yeah, uh, so again, what we do here is we specify this as a material type, and you can actually specify the gap as well. In fact, you have to specify the gap with the flyback. Um, and you include that in your magnetic model here, by just referencing referencing it in the in a coupling expression between those two windings, so we're coupling winding L2 to L3, and we're going to use this material to do it. And the coupling we're actually saying here, we're going to make that one. So we're assuming zero leakage inductance, but it gives you an ability then to for this system to actually do simulations based on the nonlinear BH curve. Um, it's important we include the air gap too. You can see that there's a gap parameter here. Um, so you can put your air gap in there, which is important to get you uh, the behavior you're, you're expecting. Um, and then the value field on the turns here gives you, um, is how you specify the number of turns on that course. So we're going 61 turns to 22 turns. So let's model, uh, let's model that. And in fact, what I've done here on this particular um, screen is using that nonlinear material and taking the power level from 50 watts to 100 watts, so pushing the magnetic core a lot harder. So you can see now, firstly, at 100 watts output power, we're much more heavily into CCM operation. You know, the, the core flux density is very much um, uh, keeping away from zero. However, you can also see now, because we've got a nonlinear material in here, we've actually starting to see the effects of saturation on the primary current. So this green, uh, oh, sorry, wrong track. Yeah, the green trace here, hopefully you can see my mouse pointer now. The green trace here is our primary current, and therefore we're starting to see the onset of saturation here um, as, as we go up in power level, which is what you'd expect. You know, we, we designed the magnetics for 50 watts output, so you'd expect that running 100 watts, we're gonna start to have problems. Um, where this sort of thing might be useful is even if you've designed a converter uh, under nominal conditions to have a sensible flux density oper of, of operation, under saturation or during startup, oh, sorry, under startup conditions or transient load conditions, you might transiently run that into saturation if your primary side current limit isn't well defined. So it does give you a way just to check under transient conditions, have you potentially got a situation where you might have partial saturation and therefore a reliability issue. Um, this actually is a good example of, of perhaps the education side of um, 
or capabilities of when you're using simulation. When I was putting this, this sl these slides together for this webinar um, and starting to model that hysteresis curve in, 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 the, in, the, in the flyback converter, it got me thinking. Um, because you can put actually a, a hysteresis curve in here with a, with a finite area, um, the loss in your, or the, the core loss in your uh, flyback converter can be modeled by that, essentially the energy contained within that BH curve. So maybe we can actually use the post-processing capabilities of our simulation environment to take a look at core loss. Uh, so essentially we can, we can, the simulation will be able to give us core loss data over time. So that's, this is really a good example of, of how you can use the simulation tool and the data analysis capabilities to look at things that you would not be able to measure necessarily easily on the bench. So what I did here, let's, I, I just looked at comparing the energy into the primary winding over time versus the energy out of the secondary winding over time. And I've specified for the moment zero resistance in the windings of these transformers. So the only difference in power between those two, um, those two energy level or the difference in energy is, is going to be the power loss due to the core. Um, and this was really just a bit, a bit of a thought experiment because it's a, the simulation environment allows me to very easily to calculate that. So, for example, um, I, if I look at the uh, the power, for, let's actually let's start at the bottom. The power into the primary winding is just the product of the voltage, the instantaneous voltage, and the instantaneous current. Multiply them together, which is what I've done here. And then if you integrate that, you get energy. So we're just plotting here energy in, into the primary winding over time, or the integral of power, but the, that is essentially energy. So the, the, the bottom trace here is energy into the primary winding. We did the same for the energy out of the secondary winding here, and then looked at the difference of the two. Um, and you can see here that the simulation predicts over that 10 millisecond simulation period, that we get about 11.6 millijoules of loss in that core. And therefore, let's say, therefore that the core loss is 1.16 watts. And, and that would be a reasonable assumption that based on that power loss. Let's compare that to what we would expect to get from a Steinmetz approach. So remember, looking at core loss from a Steinmetz approach, you need to know what your uh, frequency is, your um, peak flux density and your temperature. So this is all normalized to 25 degrees C. For N87 material, looking at the data sheets, we predict about 133, 134 kilowatts per meter cubed for that particular core. And the particular core, the EF30157, has 4,000 millimeters cubed volume. So that predicts, from the Steinmetz equations at least, 540 milliwatts of, lock, of core loss. So it's not a great match. Um, you know, one's about 50% of the other, so that's not a fantastic result. But I think really what I was trying to illustrate, and the reason I left this slide in, is simulation allows you to look at things in a different way. And, and, and literally, I'd not thought of looking at BH curve uh, losses like this before putting this, these slides together. So I thought, well, let's give it a go. And that's really the power of simulation. It's the education side of simulation. It gives you an environment just to try something out. And it might not work, but it might actually be something that then is quite useful in the future. So hopefully this, this explains why I thought that was quite a useful little thought exercise to go on. Um, yeah, so that's SPICE, uh, the SPICE tool covered. Um, Plex is a, a different sort of a tool. Um, and again, I would like to discuss some of the, the strengths, weaknesses, and some examples of how we've used it. So firstly, what is Plex? Um, Plex is a, a, a more recent development. Well, probably I, I don't know when it was actually originally developed, but certainly not back in the 70s. It's a, um, a multi-physics system whereby you can simultaneously model multiple aspects of a power converter, and it's specifically designed for modeling power electronic systems. So it can model electrical, magnetic, thermal, and mechanical parameters simultaneously. So it's very good for EV type applications or motor drive applications. Um, in comparing it to PSPICE, it tends to use more of a behavioral model approach rather than device macro models. So it tends to use lookup tables, for example, rather than calculating um, you know, semiconductor uh, parameters. And that allows it to operate much faster than a PSPICE environment might do. 
Um, the key differentiator, and this is one thing you have to be careful of, um, this tool doesn't model switching transitions, you know, the trajectory of the switching transition. It assumes that the device will switch infinitely quickly. And what it does is it, it assigns an en energy loss metric uh, to that switching event. And the reason it does that is if you don't have to spend time calculating the switching trajectory of your system, it means your simulation is way, way faster. And as I said before, if you don't care about the switching trajectory in terms of your model, Actually, this allows you to operate simulations much faster and still maintain um, good quality information coming out the other end. Um, you can't model, obviously, anything which really relates to switching dynamics very easily using this. Things like QRR or Miller plateaus in, in gate drive, this is not the right tool for that. But for other stuff, the vast majority of other, uh, of other simulations, it's very, very powerful. Um, the one I'm going to describe to you is what we use here, which is a block set version that sits on top of MATLAB and Simulink. And, and I quite like that environment because it allows you to then embed your simulation within a Simulink environment as well and start doing some behavioral modeling, which I'll show you shortly. So let's go back to our 50 watt flyback, our favorite little converter. Um, this is what the simulation looks like for that same converter operating in Plex. Um, the big difference now, you can see that um, we have a magnetic circuit here. So the red lines here um, are indicating we have a magnetic circuit. And our magnetic circuit consists of a hysteretic model of the core, which I, I'm going to detail in a minute, in series with the reluctance of an air gap. And you can build up all sorts of um, different magnetic structures here to model your components, both linear and nonlinear. But the, thing, the key thing here is it's very visible on the simulation that you've got a magnetic circuit there. Um, it includes this nonlinear magnetic model for N87. And again, this is something I, I've put in as part of one of my library um, parameters. It uses a slightly different modeling um, technique, not the Giles Atherton. It uses this uh, thing called, I don't actually know how to pr um, pronounce it, a Prizac Pri model maybe. Um, whereby there are certain key parameters for the uh, for the magnetic material. Firstly, you've got to put in the details for your core, so the cross-sectional area and the, le the length of the flux path. Then it characterizes the shape and behavior of the BH curve by identifying this remnants flux here, uh, remnant flux density, BR, so the, where we're crossing the, the, the y-axis here. The coercive field strength HC is this point here, where the curve is crossing the zero flux line. And then we also need to specify HSAT and BSAT, which we have to decide what they are. And then the mu R is the slope of this line as we go out towards infinity. So you have to come up with a way of, of, of mapping your material properties into that sort of a model. But we've done that here for N87. And again, we've included that single air gap. So let's take a, a simulation of that and compare Plex versus what I showed you for P-SPICE. So you can see here, they're very, very similar as you would hope. Um, in both cases here, the flux density is starting from almost zero, not quite, and reaching yeah, close to 290 millitesla. It, it's slightly lower in this case here. Um, the output ripple is about the same. The peak primary current is about the same. And you can see here the, the switching voltages are, are roughly the same as well. Um, so the two, the two tools compare pretty well. The first thing to see, though, is the simulation time I measured for Plex doing that same 10 milliseconds of operation was less than two seconds. And for P-SPICE, it was about five seconds. So already you're seeing the benefits of, the, of, a, of, a, of a simulation engine which doesn't worry about switching transitions too much. It allows it to progress through that much more quickly. Um, the other thing you can start doing with Plex then is start looking at the thermal domain as well. <coughs> and you can see here, the way we do that is we draw a nice blue box over the device that we want to include in a thermal simulation. So I've included here our primary side MOSFET, which I'm at the moment mod modeling with just a, a 450 milliohm on resistance here. Um, and again, you start to see that um, you're able then to... to include other components. If you wanted to put other heat loss on there, you just need to drag that box over the, the element you're trying to model. Um, 
what you need to do then for that heat sink is you then specify a thermal capacitance for that heat sink. So if it's a very big heat sink, it'll have a high thermal capacitance, which means that it, you have to start putting a lot of heat into it over a long time for its temperature to rise. So it's storing heat energy. And then that heat sink will have a thermal resistance to some form of local ambient. So here I've defined a, a local ambient being 25 degrees C, a thermal resistance of 30 degrees C per watt for that heat sink here. Um, the MOSFET model, as I said, can just be an RDS on, or you can include more detailed switching loss. Um, and the switching loss, again, it's like a lookup table approach for the MOSFETs. You can specify turn on and turn off energy. Um, or you can specify cower models there from the junction all the way out through to the heat sink. So you can specify a lot of detail in that MOSFET. Um, but here I'm just specifying it as a, as a constant on resistance. Um, the key thing here, this is actually just a, a simulation over 10 seconds of this this flyback converter running. You can see here that the heat sink heats up from 25 to just over 40 degrees C in that time frame. Um, I've made quite a small thermal capacitance on that heat sink to get, give it a chance to, to warm up quite quickly. The important thing here is that when you start putting devices onto a heat sink like that, all of the things like are, are on and the 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 uh, turn on and turn off energy can be specified as a function of temperature. So what we really mean is during a simulation, as the heat sink gets warmer and warmer, the properties can dynamically change to give you, which replicates what would happen in real life. Um, so at higher temperature, your R on might increase a little bit. So you can include those effects in your in your model here, which is not something I've seen done in SPICE before. I, I may be wrong, but this is something that can definitely do that sort of simulation, which includes temperature effects as well. So this one is a bit of fun. There's a, uh, stability modeling is uh, something we're going to talk about in our control loop the um, theory uh, webinars in a few weeks' time. Um, but here is a model of how we've used the Plex tool to look at the small signal frequency response of this particular flyback converter and then to design a control loop to sit around it. So what we do is this is, a, um, this is our Plex block sitting in Simulink. And then the Plex tool set also includes an AC sweep to, um, uh, system, which allows us to inject a small signal in on one end and then monitor the gain and phase of what comes out the other end, which essentially is our frequency response of our power converter. Inside the block, I've had to include a few extra things. So this is just a standard PWM generation uh, block. So it generates um 100 percent pwm if we put a value of one on the input and zero p zero uh, percent duty cycle if we put zero on the input i've included a dc operating point as well because we have to have this we want to try and find the small signal response at a certain operating point and then the ac block just injects small signal perturbations into that whole system via this port on the input the gain and phase are then gathered as a function of frequency automatically by the tool and it must be done around that DC operating point. So when we run that simulation, it takes a little while to run. What we end up getting out the other end, you can see, is a classical sort of frequency response. This, this one's just a voltage mode controlled flyback, but it could be a very, very complex converter here with maybe current mode control or something else that is incredibly difficult to model analytically. But the circuit simulation doesn't really care about complexity. You can, you can, you can still use the same approach. So this gives you the frequency response of your power converter, which is a fantastically useful thing to have. Um, knowledge of that frequency response allows us then to design closed loop control. So for example, I, th this is just very, very basic integral control. Um, uh, you, wouldn't even, you wouldn't really use this in practice. You'd, you'd, you'd have a more complex um, control uh, frequency response, but this one works for the purposes of demonstrating what we can do. So if you remember before, um, if I go back a slide actually, let's say we want to cross this um, system over at 200 hertz, which is a very low frequency. That would put us around about here, and the gain of the power stage there is about 48 dBs. So if I design my integral control, which gives us good DC accuracy in our system, 
for minus 48 dBs at 200 hertz, our whole closed loop system will cross over at 200 hertz or thereabouts. And it will be stable because at 200 hertz, the, um, the phase shift of the power stage is, is, is acceptably low. In fact, it's almost zero. So to model that or to, to create that sort of integral control, we need a control frequency response given by this expression. So we have an S domain term here, uh, typical sort of um, uh, Laplace approach. The good thing, and the reason I've put this in the particular webinar here, is that when you have the Plex tool set with uh, sitting on top of MATLAB and Simulink, then you can actually model the control response just as a mathematical block outside your circuit. So the, the yellow block here is the circuit Plex, the, the circuit simulation done by Plex. But everything else outside here is just normal Simulink. It's just maths. Um, so what I've done is to put our transfer function here, um, which is exactly what you can see in the curve here. I've put that in this normal sort of um, compensator place. I've taken the output, fed it through. I'll describe this block in a minute. I've fed it back, subtracted it from the reference, and that creates our closed loop system. Um, this block here, the plex loop gain, allows us then to do the same analysis of the closed loop gain of the system um, in simulation. So you can check that adding that control response in is giving us a, a stable system. And that's what you can see here. This, this is the output of that simulation shown here, including the, clo in, including the, co the compensator response here. So if we look... Oops, with the whole loop here, you can see we're crossing now at around about 200 hertz or thereabouts, and the phase shift is, is fairly benign at that point. So we've got a stable system, and that's great. So this has allowed us to explore the frequency response of our power converter and design a very basic controller all in the simulation environment, which is a great thing to be able to do. And then if we do a time domain simulation of that closed loop system, uh, this is just up to 10 milliseconds again here. Um, you can see that within about, um, uh, where are we here? Sorry, that's 10 milliseconds there. So within about 5 milliseconds, we're pretty much close to the DC operating point, 48 volts output. So it's it, again, it, it, it all starts to tie up. And then you can do all sorts of other transient testing if you wanted to as well. But it shows, it shows the power of that system. Okay, um, one point of reference here is um, simulation versus expert tools. Uh, as you become more experienced in designing power electronics, um, you might not necessarily need to use simulation every time. And this, this is an example of where it may, may not make sense to do a small signal response in, you know, in a simulation package, because maybe the, you know, your familiarity with a particular topology allows you to create an expert tool um, to, to do it for you instead. So for example, that voltage mode flyback is something that we've, you know, we, we've used year, over years and years and years, and we've built up a model of that in MathCAD to allow us to predict, uh, it uses, well, it uses average small signal state space modeling techniques. So a mathematical uh, modeling technique, which allows us to predict the frequency or calculate the frequency response of that, of that power converter rather than simulate it. Um, it can be quite complex with the maths to do that, but as you become more familiar with those tools and, and, and those topologies, you might be able to start building your own tools to allow you to do this sort of stuff, which is always going to be much, much faster than any simulation. Um, so we, for, for common topologies, we tend to use um, the, these sorts of expert tools because we've built them up over time, um, and they literally just give you the answer. She, this is actually this, the, the uh, expert tool output for that very same 50 watt voltage mode controlled flyback and it behaves very similarly to what you uh, what you saw before uh, that's question four there please jose um so briefly coming now towards the end of this webinar there are some other tools as well um as i said we don't really have an affiliation to um to any one one vendor um so i wanted to mention a few other ones that you might want to consider Firstly, um, LT Spice is probably the most well-known um, free simulation tool. It's a fantastic tool, actually, and it's uh, the number of clients that we see using this is unbelievable. Um, so it was it was actually uh, the Spice engine originally. Um, LT Spice was uh, launched by Linear Technology. Uh, Linear Technology got uh, taken over by Analog Devices. Um, 
the benefits of that you can see you can go to the website and take a look um, it was introduced in 1999 and it's very very widely used across industry and academia and it allows you to put your own parts in as well uh, we, we have used it a little bit um, I'd say compared to the commercial tools obviously the maybe the post processing capability and the, um, the model creation stuff isn't quite as sophisticated but for a free tool it's fantastic um, you can download it for free or just type LT Spice into in any browser. You'll be able to get the details. Um, this is an interesting one, and this has only recently happened. Um, so TI, Texas Instruments, have recently, I guess, come up with some level of licensing deal with Cadence and have launched a, a free version of PSpice. So the PSpice tool I showed you earlier in this webinar, you can, you can get a, a, a version of that now to use for free from Texas Instruments. And that only happened, I think, probably summer 2020, something like that. So um, it's, it's actually very, very powerful. Um, it's a slightly limited version of that commercial tool set, as you'd expect, um, but you can still do a lot with it. You can simulate many, many different um, aspects of simulation. And it's the same, it's the same front end engine that is used in the um, or front end environment that's used in the commercial package. So I would encourage you to take a look at that because I think that's quite a neat uh, and uh, uh, something that's going to be very useful for you to, to, to run simulations on. Uh, and again, you can download it for free. Um, in terms of other commercial simulation tools, there are quite a few out there. Um, there's uh, Symmetrix or Simplis uh, uh, is dedicated towards power electronic simulation. So maybe take a look at that. Um, this tool has become quite um, quite popular, I believe. PSIM uh, allows you to do uh, uh, simulate digital systems as well. So you can see there's a lot of um, TI DSPs in there. So a, a, another interesting opportunity for power electronic simulation there. Um, the Sabre tool has been around a long time, actually, and now I believe it's owned by Synopsys. Um, uh, I haven't seen that one being used quite so often as the other ones. May maybe it's a cost. I, I, I don't know. But it's it's worth taking a look at. Um, it's Some of these systems incorporate P-Spice engines as well as other um, things as well. So to take a look at those if you're interested, um, because there's multiple options out here for simulation now. And we can launch question five there, please. Um, so just to summarize, we're pretty much on the hour now. Um, hopefully I've shown in the very brief webinar today how simulation tools can be used to significantly reduce development risk in power electronic converters. And that's really what they should be focused on. It's about risk reduction and enhancing productivity of your design teams. Um, we don't yet, or we haven't yet found any one tool that does everything that we need it to do. Certain tools are focused in certain areas for doing certain things very well. There's, I don't know of one that does everything in the way we'd want it to do. So we end up running multiple tools. Um, this is something to be very careful of, especially if you're um, perhaps a more junior engineer. If you get spend too much time simulating, you can get stuck in that simulation trap and actually delay developing hardware and ultimately most companies need that, that are using simulation need to deliver hardware and products. So just be careful of, of over simulating because it's an easy trap to fall into. Um, I would say simulation and prototype prototyping do sit completely side by side. Um, you know, if you just prototype and, and build hardware, you may be not understanding fully exactly how it's working. Or if you just do simulation where you've got no idea whether what you're simulation is, simulating is accurate or not. So they really go hand in hand. And as you develop your, your skills on the bench, then you should enhance your, your ability to simulate those same, those same systems. And they, your, your ability and speed of execution then starts to increase over time. Um, if you really are just at the start, so maybe you're a student that's joining us today, um, uh, interested in power electronics, simulation is a is a great education tool. Um, but in my my experience, the the best way to get um, uh, to become uh, or to increase your skill set is to start building hardware. So don't if you're if you're very junior, very uh, early in your career. Don't let simulation take over. Uh, try to get hands on on the bench. That's when you really learn how hardware works, and then you can feed that back into your into your simulation model, and, and, and you get better much faster then. Okay, I think with that, we're just at the end of our webinar now. Uh, so thank you very much for listening, and we'll we'll move on to some questions.
Let's see what we've got. Uh, I can see some questions have come in. Okay. Um, okay, let's start with a question here. Which one has the possibility to account for thermal impedance, plex or spice? Um, they do it in slightly different ways in my experience. So as, as I showed you in the, um, in the plex, um, the plex environment you can put your heat sink on there and actually then um, the simulation will look at the temperature of that device for a particular operating point and if it gets hotter it'll adjust the parameters of that device according to what you specify in your model so plex can definitely do it um uh, spice i have seen some models particularly infineon have some very good models for their mosfets and they have different levels of models level norm level one i think that goes up to level three something like that and they become more complex as you go up. So um, take a look at those because some of those also include in their in their model parameters um, ways to model junction temperature. So you get extra ports on the output of your of your of your MOSFET, which allow you to do um, thermal analysis. It's, it's essentially it's a behavioural model for the thermal environment, but I don't think it models a changing junction temperature. Uh, I think it just models the, the heat flow out through a through a device. Um, let's have a look here. Um, okay, so I'm just looking through the questions here. Um, so I know that co-simulation with MATLAB and Simulink Complex is quite convenient and reasonably fast. Are there any other such software enabling co-simulation with Simulink? I don't know on that, to be honest. Um, uh, Plex is available as standalone as well. I, I quite like it when, when the simulation environment, as you say, is, is fairly tightly coupled to, to Simulink and MATLAB because you can do a lot of post-processing then. Um, I expect there probably are other software that is compatible and, and, and to allow co-simulation with Simulink. I just don't know of any at the moment. Um, so then we've got um, a lot of examples in LT Spice are open loop. Is it okay in simulation? Um, so that that's uh, it depends what you're simulating. You know, um, if you're sim if if you care about like a DC operating point, for example, and you're looking at um, losses in a component, well, you don't necessarily need it to be closed loop. You just need to know what the operating point is there, set the duty cycle and run it open loop, and then the results are what you need. However, if you're trying to create a closed loop system, then you'll obviously want to model the closed loop effect. So it really, it just really depends on what you're trying to achieve. M most of the time for the simulations we're doing, um, open loop is fine because we're interested in component stresses and it's only towards the end of the simulation um, exercise that we start looking at, at, at closing the loop and doing the small signal stuff. So it really just depends what you're trying to do. Um, that's, that's another one here. When I used small signal analysis tool from Plex, it provided several perturbation tools, not only AC sweep, but also impulse response analysis. Somehow I found the results are not good depending on parameters such as amplitude, frequency, and range. Any comments? Uh, yeah, the, the, Richard, I think um, that, that's a very good, a very good comment. Um, they're not perfect these tools in fact it took i was i was just finishing off this webinar yesterday um to include the plex closed loop stuff and it took me quite a while to tweak the parameters of um of that ac sweep tool to make it work properly and if you might if if you saw on my slides in fact if i go back uh oh, hang on where are we here go back to the plex example uh, yeah, yeah. This is the Plex example. You can see there's a couple of little missing data points here. I was hoping no one would spot them, but what's actually happened there is Plex hasn't managed for those particular frequency points to get a stable enough um, simulation to extract the data it needs. So it just doesn't put a point there. Luckily for me, there are, there are only a couple of points like that. But you're right; it can it can struggle um, to do that, and it's generally if it's if it if it has problems converging. Um, 
when I first started doing, well, actually you can see in the model here, this has got a linear model here for the core. When I first started trying to get this data out, I used the non-linear model and that made the, the convergence problem even worse. So again, it comes back to um, just simulating, if you're, you know, if we're interested here in simulating the, um, the small signal response, make everything else as simple as possible in your model because then it has the best chance of converging and giving good data. And then you you just see the dominant effects. Um, I, I, even though these tools are very powerful, to have one model which simulates everything in perfect accuracy, I, I just don't think that exists. And I, I don't see the I don't think it would necessarily need to have a reason to exist you just want to have the simulation do what you want it to do and then you can you know you you, you you've achieved generally what you need to then um other things that affect it so the the injection amplitude um that you mentioned there so this block here the ac sweep you can you, you can change the um the perturbation the ac perturbation value um and i think when it the default value in that plex block was about one i think it was one millivolt or whatever that works out to be here but it was it would have caused a tiny perturbation in the duty cycle based on the gain of this block um so i actually changed that to be um 10 millivolts perturbation because you know i've, I've got something like a dc operating point of 0 0.29 so if i vary 0 0.1 around that that is probably going to be okay for a small signal analysis and remember the way the small signal analysis works is it's got to extract that underlying frequency content from the switching noise. So if you if you don't inject enough signal, it really struggles to do that. Um, let's have a quick look here. Um, can you talk a little bit about the things that you keep in mind with trade-offs when selecting a time step, for example, simulating a converter? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point. Um, if I refer back to the, some of the piece by stuff, um, one if you start if you run a simulation in PSPICE and you get a problem with convergence, sometimes you get, the, the simulation won't complete and it'll 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 stop and it'll tell you that there's some sort of problem with a certain part of the circuit. You can start specifying a minimum, uh, sorry, a maximum time step which can get around that. So in the simulations I gave here, I didn't, I didn't need to do that. But in the past, I've, for example, for a 10 millisecond simulation, I've specified things like a maximum time step of 10 milliseconds, um, and that allowed that that same simulation to, to to run through to completion. So you have to play around with that a little bit. Um, the consequence when you specify a maximum time step is that makes your simulation run slower. So that's always going to be the trade-off there. Again, it, it it all points towards making your simulation model as simple as it can be for the effects you're trying to, um, to simulate. And then you've got the maximum chance of convergence without having to use um, maximum time steps and stuff like that. Um, I think are there any more for me to go? Hi, there, is some, there are some questions on the chat. So one is... Oh. One is how to display magnetic flux density waveform, how you manage to display that on SPICE. Oh, okay. Um, I wonder if I can bring it up on... Bear with me a minute. I'll see if I can bring up that exactly exactly that simulation and I can show you. And there was also a comment that it will be nice if we manage to have some live simulation. Oh, stuff. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe I can solve both of those and do that now. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a go it's putting me on the spot but let's have a quick go um uh, where is it where is the flyback oh, there it is you never know we might be in luck Then there's also a comment about participa part participation certificate. So I think that there is no, this is not the case of having a participation participation certificate. No, not, we haven't done that. It's, uh, I mean, um, no, no, we haven't done that. But hopefully it's been valuable anyway. Um, I'll just share another screen and hopefully I'll be able to show you a live demonstration. Um, so bear with me a minute. Hang on. I'm just juggling the screens here. Yeah, okay. So can you see that okay, Jose? 
Yeah, probably you can, you have to zoom in a bit. Okay. On the circuit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this, I believe, I can't remember what state I left this model in, so I've literally just brought it up here. Um, let's just try doing a quick simulation of that and see what happens. Okay. Okay, I have to bring another another window up now to show you the results. Um, oh, actually. Um, actually, that's actually not worked, that simulation there. It's got a convergence problem template. I'm just wondering why that is. <laughs> oh, hang on. This is an older model. That's why. Okay. I've probably got the wrong model there. Um, I'll tell you, we're not, I can't, I don't think we're going to have time to show it today. Um, essentially, what you do is when, if I show, oh, unless I can find, bring the. Maybe I can bring the answer. Oh, no, I, I can't really do it at the moment. I haven't got the, 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 the information prepared. Um, essentially, if you're, uh, the, the question relates back, though, to um, how do we show the flux density in this in this transformer core? Well, when you get to the um, the, the, the PSPICE uh, output window, which I will, uh, I, I won't show because it's got a load of errors on it at the moment. You can um, you can basically put a probe on all sorts of different aspects. You can you you can you 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 pull up um, your display window, and then you can choose from a list of all the parameters um, what you want to display. And one of those parameters is the B field in that particular core, and one of the parameters is the H field. So all I've done is to pull up the B field, and it just shows you it straight away. But it has to be; it only knows that there's a B field there if you've put in this nonlinear or, or this this coupling magnetic circuit here. Otherwise, it won't appear on your um, you know on your options of, of things to display. Um, was that the only uh, one in the question in the chat? Because there, I think there was maybe one or two more in the normal questions. Yeah, I think just comments about that recent change of uh, Spice for TI that before it was Tina, but it's just I think it's just a recent change. I googled that and it's just in September. When yeah. They very recently, yeah, I think um, I, th I think Tina was a sort of a, a historic thing that TI had, um, but it was more proprietary to TI. Whereas if you use Spice, the, the reason that LT Spice has become almost universal as a free tool is because it's well, firstly, it's free, but also it, it's a, it's a it's a completely open source Spice engine, so you can put your own models in there. The trouble is when you have a proprietary tool developed by a manufacturer, is you get tied into their environment. It doesn't allow to do that and i think that's probably why ti have moved towards the um the cadence p spice world because it it, it it gives them their version of what lt spice has achieved for linear tech and analog devices um so let's just check there's also another comment just right now on the chat if you check it's just about the book combining theory and p spice simulation at uh, this kind of level that you Oh, okay. um, there are some good books out there, actually. I've probably got one on my shelf. Hang on. Uh, let's have a look. <laughs> have a look. I can recommend a few books then. Yeah, that's the one. And... So there's quite a few, um, quite a few good books I could recommend. Um, this is a book that you get, or if we got from our supplier when we bought the P Spice tool set, and it's just published by um, uh, th this chap here. And it's it's uh, it works very well. It gives you an introduction on how to use the tools in macro models and all that sort of stuff. So that that's a very good one. Um, there's another excellent book written by a gentleman called uh, Stephen Sandler, which is this one here. Um, in particular for you know power supply simulation that sort of stuff this book is very much recommended it's excellent um, so do take a look at that one and 
if you're really interested into the details, this this is this is a wonderful book. If you're really interested in the details of modeling specifically semiconductor devices like diodes, MOSFETs, all that sort of stuff in real detail, um, this is a classic book and it it goes into a lot of detail about how you can or the how you can go about modeling those devices and and some of the physical effects and what it's doing so it couples all the way through from the semiconductor theory through to the spice models specifically for diode fet all that sort of stuff it's quite hard going from a from a theoretical perspective but it's probably one of the best texts i could recommend so do take a look at that one Okay. Just a minor comment on the chat now. If it is possible to do the same with LT spice, than P spice for the magnetics, I suppose is possible as they are based on the same. Yeah, but, I, I guess. Sure. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm not really a specialist in LT spice. There are there are a lot more people uh, that that use LT spice that might be able to answer that one. Um, the the I, I would have thought so because really all, all that P spice is doing in in modeling magnetics like that is putting a sort of a front end um data capture capability to allow you to pull in magnetic parameters and form models but a mathematical model is just a, a set of numbers and equations so i'm sure there probably would be a way to do it in lt spice the only thing is that there may not be a, a like a, a nice front end to it that, that helps you do it so you might have to do it far more manually um, and that's the re that's really the trade-off with a free tool versus the commercial tool is is that the free tools work really well but you tend to have to do a lot more of the front end um, work yourself. But I, I might I might be wrong. There might be some tools out there that that, that LT Spice allow you to do that now. And then questions. I think there is one missing. It's about the use of the proofs in LT Spice and P Spice. The differences. Okay. Let me just dig that one out. Uh... So, oh yes, here we go. I found using the probes in LT Spice is much easier. We don't need to set them up. And I can see that you need to set the probes up in P-SPICE. Um, I, I don't know if really, um, I, I think, if you're used to using one particular engine like LT-SPICE, you will find it easy to use because you're used to using it. Um, and uh, it, It's pretty much the same when you get used to using P-SPICE. You can use the probes as I showed you on the, you know, putting little markers down. Um, however, we don't tend to use that too much when you get into the, the, the post processing side, the actual looking at the, the waveforms, you literally just pull the waveforms up from a window to show what you want or to do, perform calculations on that. So I, I haven't really found one to be better or worse than the other really there. It just depends what you're used to. Um, I think that's probably it. I think we've answered hopefully most of the questions today. Um, so yeah, unless there's any further questions, thank you very much for joining today. I hope it's been useful. Uh, and check out our website for further uh, events that we've got planned coming up. Uh, we have re reliability next week. And then, Jose, I think your condition monitoring is the week after, or is it on the third? It's on the fifth, I think. OK, yes, yeah, so next Thursday. Um, and we'll be releasing the rest of our webinars quite soon as well. So um, do hope. I hope you can join us for those. And I hope it's been useful today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.